Hi, welcome yet again to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video is going to be the fifth one in a series of videos on Jean Paul Sartre. In the last video, we focused mostly on the dimension of responsibility, which is, of course, related to Sartre's radical envisioning of the nature of human freedom. We also talked a little bit about the ethical implications of that vision, which, of course, revolve mostly around the idea of good faith and bad faith, which means that the kind of ethics that evolve out of Sartre's vision is not going to be a behavior-driven ethical vision, but rather one that circulates around owning one's freedom and one's choices, and at the same time owning one's responsibility for one's freedom and one's choices. So I'd like to start off this video by maybe uh, recapping uh, a little bit of that in a provocative type way by asking you uh, a question that might seem a little bit disturbing. This is probably not the kind of question that you want to bring up, let's say, at Thanksgiving dinner with the rest of your family and uh, grandma and grandpa and all the grandchildren and <laughs> people like that gathered around the dinner table. And here's the question. Are you free enough to become a serial killer? So imagine bringing that up at the Thanksgiving table. I bet it would sort of uh, it would sort of interrupt the festive mood, shall we say? Like, are you free enough? In other words, okay, let's elaborate a little on the question. Is your freedom wide enough and deep enough that you could actually become a serial killer in this life? And uh, maybe the first answer is no, not really, because uh, first of all, being a serial killer is against the law. Well. Okay, so uh, you're not free enough to break the law, is that true? Because I bet you break the law in any number of ways. I bet you uh, speed on occasion. Moreover, there are plenty of people that break the law in very serious ways. The fact of the matter is there are serial killers in the world, in case you haven't noticed. And uh, so how is it that they're free enough to do that sort of thing and you're not? Well, maybe you're free enough to break the law, including the most... Uh, the deepest kind of laws we have. I think like the law of prohibition against murder is one of the deepest ones. Okay, so maybe uh, your next thought is, no, I could never really choose to be a serial killer because it violates my own internal, personal, ethical, and moral mandates. And it's like, well, okay, so you're not free enough to go against your own internal uh, moral mandates. And I think that's obviously an illusion because uh, the fact of the matter is you could stop believing in that stuff at any and all points if you really decided to. The fact is that the it seems like your moral mandates keep you from being a serial killer, but in reality the only reason why that seems to be true is you keep choosing to defer to them. And if you were to make another kind of choice, one that would sort of open up the possibility of murder, then the fact of the matter is you could probably become a serial killer. Here's another way in which uh, you might be thinking, no, I could never be a serial killer because I'm not physically strong enough to be a serial killer. And it's like, well, uh, actually you don't have to be that strong, you know? Okay, maybe you're, you're not strong enough to, uh, to wield a knife or to bludgeon someone uh, to death, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't take much strength to shoot a gun or poison someone. And there are cases where serial killers work exactly that way. So uh, you are actually physically strong enough. You can uh, go against your more internal moral system. Uh, you can choose to violate the law. Actually, the only thing keeping you from becoming a serial killer is you. That's it. There's nothing in this life, nothing in this world that is preventing you from becoming a serial killer other than your own choices, your own freedom, and your own responsibility. Now, if you were to become a serial killer, the element of responsibility might quickly play in. Who knows? I guess it depends how good you are at it. You might have to become responsible in a legal sense for your acts as a serial killer, but that doesn't, that doesn't negate the fact that you still have the opportunity in this life to become a serial killer. Okay, so why am I bringing up this example? Because, um, uh, first of all, it's provocative. Second of all, it might invite you to wonder about how free you really are. Because if you're free enough to become a serial killer, then imagine how many other things you're actually free to do that you probably, in an everyday way, don't think you actually are. But the reality is, you are. That your freedom is way greater 
than you probably even want. You're way freer and way more responsible than you even want, and that's a big part of what motivates bad faith. Okay, so that's my way of putting a cap, I guess, on the last couple of videos, really. Hopefully in a provocative way that invites you to think and wonder about, um, you know, uh, the nature of how free you really are. Okay, so let's get into the next section. So the next section in your notes is entitled, All Reality in Hairs in Action. And here the main point is, when you're looking at the locus of choices, okay, does the choice in hair in what we say we're choosing, or even what we tell ourselves we're choosing? Or on the other hand, is the locus of our choices really what we do in this life? And for Sartre, it's going to be all about the latter. Okay, so all reality and all choices are about action. So, why is this an important point? Because it may not be clear at first. Well, you know, a lot of the time, uh, we think we're choosing one thing, but our actions are the exact opposite of that. For instance, in your notes, I wrote a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, deciding that you're going to lose weight. So if you've decided you're going to lose weight, and that's a choice you've made, and yet at the same time, you find yourself overeating pretty frequently and skipping a lot of workouts, the question is, are you really choosing to lose weight? And the Sartrean answer is no. It doesn't matter what you're telling yourself. It doesn't matter what your internal thought processes are because the issue of your choices circulates completely around the actions that you do, even if those actions are directly the opposite of what you're telling yourself and everyone else too. You know, you tell yourself, you know, well, I'm on a diet now and here you are popping bonbons into your damn yap one after the other and you're not going out to the track and you're not doing your cardio and anything else, well, uh, the choice that you think you're making is not the choice that you actually are making. So uh, a little bit of uh, quoting um, Sartre about this from your notes. So, uh, man will be what he will have planned to be. And here, this is not a very direct way of saying it. By the word plan, what he means is what you're throwing yourself forward into along the dimension of actual concrete action. So when he says plan, that's what he's getting at, this sort of throwing yourself forward along the dimension of action. So you will be what you have planned to be, what you're throwing yourself forward into, and not necessarily what you want to be. Okay, and here once again, we're at this sort of juncture where your practice of freedom may may be going against what it is you think you want. In fact, that happens a lot more often than we usually think. All right, so um, another quote a little bit, so about 10 lines beneath that uh, to get at this point. There is no reality except in action. It ain't about what you're telling yourself or anyone else. There is no reality except in action. Man is nothing else but his plan, his throwing himself forward in this particular way. He exists only to the extent that he fulfills himself. He is therefore nothing else than the ensemble of his acts, nothing else than his life. Okay, so there's the locus of choice. There's the locus of responsibility. That's what really matters not the words that we tell ourselves. We can be hypocritical, not just with other people. We can very easily and very often are, probably a lot of the time, hypocritical and in bad faith with regard to ourselves too. Okay, so next segment of your notes is entitled Freedom and Creativity. Okay, so there's going to be a pretty big intersection between freedom and creativity, and let's see, can you infer this at this point? It might be a little difficult for you to see what that intersection is, so let's talk about it a little bit. Okay, so if you followed this lecture series and followed the arc of Sartre's phenomenological analysis of freedom and responsibility, then probably you're getting the idea that ultimately freedom is in a sense directionless, because anything that we would regard as a kind of direction or preference for our choices or guidance for our choices, we have to choose to regard that as a direction or preference for our choices. So really what freedom amounts to is something very directionless and sort of undulating like an ocean, a disorienting, trackless 
expanse that we can't really see our way through. Well, if that's really the case, then, uh, and if all reality inheres in action and Sartre's ethics, okay, from the last video, is in ethics of action, then how are you supposed to make any kind of choice, right? Because it seems like without guidance, without direction, how can you uh, make choices that have a kind of sensibility or a kind of coherence or a kind of meaningfulness in your life? Well, uh, from Sartre's point of view, they very much can have a kind of coherence or meaningfulness, but it's not an a priori kind of meaningfulness, okay? So uh, think of it this way. Here's a way of thinking it of it. Your freedom is not like the color by numbers books that maybe you had to fill out when you were a little kid. You know, before before you get old enough, I guess, to nor use normal coloring books, there's a little phase, a little transitional phase, where they give you these versions of color uh, coloring books and a box of crayons. I always wanted that, that 64 one with the, the crayon sharpener in it. My parents would never get that for me. Still a bitter memory, but at any rate, um, <laughs> you know, before they let you have sort of normal kid coloring books, there's the Color by Numbers, which has these super simplified pictures in it, and it, there's kind of a, a ledger by the side that says, well, you know, pull out your red crayon and color the apple red because apples are red. Pull out your blue crayon and color the sky blue because skies are blue. Pull out your green crayon and color the lawn green because because lawns are green. So your, your freedom is not like that. That would be sort of like, um, well, God said that you had to obey the Ten Commandments and that sort of thing, and so you really have no alternative but to obey the Ten Commandments and you know other edicts in the Bible. Deuteronomy and Leviticus are like full of all these weird sort of ancient edicts and um, you know about wearing like uh, clothes of contrasting fibers and things like that. So really if your paradigm for your life is color by numbers that's a bad faith paradigm. You getting it? That's the fear principle paradigm that your life is just about doing what you're told. That is not a way of embracing or living out what you fundamentally are. It's a deflection away from what you fundamentally are, because what you fundamentally are is a free and responsible being. Okay, so if the paradigm for your life is color by numbers, or the fear principle, or just following orders of one kind or another, uh, that for Sartre is a bad faith, excuse-making, deterministic, either coward or stinker or some combination of those. That's reference to the last video. Okay, so when you get a little bit older as a kid, they give you a regular coloring book which has somewhat more complicated pictures and they don't tell you on the side which crayon you're supposed to pull out to color which object. So you have a little bit more liberty, a little bit more sort of obvious range to, to live out your freedom as a little kid, but you're still, you're still having to color in the picture that they give you. Okay, so there's still this sort of a priori, uh, a little bit uh, robotic type element to it. Okay, so when the, you get a little bit older as a kid, like later in elementary school, they start giving you blank pages. All right, so blank, and so the idea there is, and they give you the usual box of crayons that you, you draw your own picture and decide to color in however it is you will. Okay, so that's, that's starting to get more like this radical vision of freedom, all right? And uh, maybe a little bit later in elementary school, uh, they teach you origami, you know, which is, has to do with folding papers and creating sort of paper sculptures with folding papers. And, you know, maybe eventually you get the idea that, wow, you know, if they give me a paper, I could draw any picture or I could even fold it into an origami sculpture or I could crumple it up or I could tear it to bits or, uh, you know, you could color. Uh, <laughs> when I was a little kid, I had this weird fascination with coloring the entire page, one single color with paint. You know, and my parents sort of didn't know what, to, actually my brother and I did this, that uh, they didn't know what to make of that. You know, like, oh my God, we got, they, they got us easels and paints and everything. And sometimes we just green like the entire thing. Well, this is part of this uh, creative process. You realize that you don't even have to paint a picture as such, right? Now this is starting to be more and more like the Sartrean vision. Your life is more like that. You getting it? That you could do anything, any which way with it. So if you're following this analogy, then hopefully you're able to translate it a little bit to your life. If your life is as directionless as a blank page, if you can really do anything with it, even make an origami thing or anything like that, 
If your life is like that, then maybe there's no single picture for you to paint that's determined ahead of time. Your challenge is to create. Your challenge is to invent a life. Like you might invent a wild, who knows what you drew as a kid, like a landscape or something like that. You would draw whatever it is that you feel like drawing without being told what to draw. That's the nature of human freedom. And I think that most of us, when we're kids, you know, there's a certain terror when we're finally handed that blank page and uh, the, the teacher doesn't even tell us what to draw and she, or he, mine, mine were usually she's back in the day. Um, they just, and you say, well, what am I supposed to draw? And the teacher says, well, you know, draw what you want to draw. You know, whatever it happens to be. And uh, there's a little bit of anxiety like, well, will I draw well enough? You know, will the other kids laugh at me because I'm inept at drawing? Um, will, if I draw something that I want to draw, will it be socially acceptable? And hopefully you're getting the connection to life itself, right? Because if you're thrown into this existence with a blank page of freedom, like you really are free, no one's telling you what to draw because, and if someone tries to, well, in a way the fix is already in because for you to obey that person, you have to decide to obey that person. If you think that that person has the answer to the riddle of your life, you have to make a decision to regard that person in that particular way before it'll seem meaningful and coherent and all that kind of stuff. So uh, this ethics of action ultimately turns into a creative process. Your challenge is not to obey like color by numbers. Your life is not color by numbers. It can seem that way if you decide to regard it that way, but it is not itself color by numbers. Like you're given a damn blank page and not actually told, other than other people giving you their, their damn opinions, what to do with it, you know, but your other opinions, once again, you have to decide whether you're gonna obey those other opinions or not. Okay, so you're actually thrown back, back onto the blank page, even if there are people around you telling you what to draw, because you have to decide whether you're gonna obey them or not. All right, so the ultimate, um, the ultimate Sartrean sort of mandate that comes out of this analysis is to create a life, be creative, become the artist of your own life. Okay, you know, if you're thrown into this weird directionless mass of freedom and responsibility, if you're condemned to the condition of the blank page, condemned to freedom, condemned to have to live out a human existence that has no inherent a priori direction or guidance or a, a set of commandments that you have to fulfill if actually none of that is real but is on the order of a bad faith illusion, then what are you going to do with your life? Well, the answer is create something beautiful, create something interesting, create something provocative, create something that, that maybe moves you, that maybe moves the soul of the world. Why shouldn't you create a life that moves the soul of the universe if you can? And if you can't, well, you know, there are worse things in the world than trying, just a thought. Okay, so there's very much this very creative XR. I'm starting to get excited. You know, you get excited sometimes when you're talking about things that matter. <laughs> Imagine the odds in a college class. Okay, so, um, so the exhortation, which we'll see a little bit later in the next video too in a different form, is to become the artist of your own life because you really are free. No one's really telling you what life to live. It's all an illusion insofar as people seem to be doing that and you have to decide whether to take them seriously and at any and all points you can decide not to take them seriously including me by the way we professors and teachers are in the circuit too the student has all the power let's make no mistake about it the professor does not have the power to make you think anything at all without your permission without your acquiescence without your deciding that you're going to pay attention in some way or another all right, so once again, maybe you're way more powerful as a student than you think you are because the keys to learning and also to ignorance lie in your hands and they always have. All the way from kindergarten when you were running with scissors and eating the damn paste and taking naps all the way up till now. The power has always been yours. So the question is not whether that's true or not because it's obviously true. The question is whether you're going to lay claim to your power as a human being or not. 
Okay, so next segment in your notes. We have the war we deserve, and here I'm quoting from your reading assignment. And this has to do with uh, the temptation to engage in bad faith by thinking of ourselves as victims, like life's victims in one way or another. And I think that this is particularly apropos to our own time, which is what, like 75 years after he wrote, well, actually 78, but who's counting years after uh, he wrote this. So um, he wrote this in the middle of World War II. We noted that before in an earlier lecture. So in typical Parisian provocative style, he says this, in page 64, 65, 66 of your reading assignment. What happens to me, what seems to happen to you, like life victimizing you, actually happens through you. Okay, in other words, you're participating in it. You have some say so about it. Thus, there are no accidents in a life. If I am mobilized in a war, this war is my war. It is in my image and I deserve it. The peculiar character of human reality is that it is without excuse. Therefore, it remains for me only to lay claim to this war. To live this war is to choose myself through my choice of myself. Thus, I am this war. I am this war. You know, if you think of your life as a kind of war, like Heraclitus did back in classical Greek antiquity, that war is the father of all things. Okay, so, um, all right, so this is definitely running against the grain of our politically correct culture, and maybe you've detected this before this point in the class, so I wrote a par paragraph about it for you. Um, the question is, um, how powerful do you really want to be in your life? Because Maine maybe the main variable in that equation is the extent to which you lay claim to your freedom and your responsibility, your world engagement, and the extent to which you renounce all of that or pretend like that's not true is an indicator of how weak you're going to be in life. You know, the old um, 60s and 70s author Carlos Castaneda, who wrote a series of about 10 books that were sort of popular at the time, says it this way in one of them. Um, we make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. So let me say that again in the spirit of this Sartrean analysis. We choose to make ourselves miserable or feel like victims, or we choose to make ourselves strong. The amount of work is exactly the same. Okay, I'm paraphrasing, I'm altering the quote. I said it right the first time, and then I sort of altered it to fit this Sartrean thing a little bit. So consider your life in light of that, that you make yourself miserable or you make yourself strong, the amount of work is the same. Okay, so um, it's a kind of exhortation to a kind of empowerment if you think about it. All right, so let's see. Uh, I guess let's put an end on this little video because I want to do the next one, hopefully, in one video and not dice it up. So let's end this video here. I hope you're having a great day in the middle of the corona apocalypse. So okay, so how could you um, how could you take the corona apocalypse up in a Sartrean way? Well, think about that last thing, you know, you make yourself miserable in your quarantine or you make yourself strong. The amount of work is the same. And with that, have a great day. Take care.